So I'm giving two lectures on this module. My name's Mark Pallon. I'm actually a microbial genomicist, but they get me to talk about genes and genomes in human evolution for a couple of lectures in this uh, course and some in the third year. Now, uh, I'm afraid I haven't got a handout ready for this lecture today, but we'll, I'm giving another one on Monday, so I'll get them all ready. You'll have two lots of handouts on Monday. What I will be doing, though, is making a recording of this. So this is being recorded, the voice is being recorded, and it will be available as a slide cast on YouTube uh, within a day or so. Um, I'll, I'll put up a link on WebCT to the YouTube channel so you can find it. I'll also be putting the slides up onto a public slide for sharing facility called SlideShare. Uh, and you'll be able to download those if you want to. So there's two lectures, as I say, uh, in, in, in my uh, set of teaching here. Um, I thought you just, uh, are we, are we going to get more people coming in? Shall we wait a minute or? Yeah. Because we're almost rammed to the to full in here. We won't fit any more in. Well, anyway, I, let's, right, one or two more, here we go. It is now 12 o'clock, so I will get started. So the first lecture is going to be on who's our closest relative, and then the second one will be looking at what comparisons between human and ape genomes have told us about what it means to be human. So the first one is kind of a gentle introduction and looking at the evidence before we actually had a full human genome and a full chimp and orang and gorilla genome to compare. So when we're looking at human evolution, you've probably already had a lot of lectures on human evolution, and you've been taught about things from one particular angle, from the, from the angle of morphology. Uh, but we do have this second line of evidence that comes from genetics and from, from DNA sequences. So if we look back over time, uh, going back to the earliest uh, relationship uh, to, to, to living primates, uh, there we really have to look at genetic information and we can look at the morphology of, uh, uh, of living organisms there's a period where we can only look at the fossil record and look at the morphology of the fossil record. So when we're looking at things like Homo erectus or Australopithecus and Ardipithecus, we really have to just look at the fossil record. Interestingly, is we'll say more next year, in next year's lecture, actually for more recent uh, uh, extinct um, relatives like Homo neanderthalensis or Neanderthals, we now actually have ancient DNA evidence alongside morphology. And in among anatomically modern humans, we can actually do quite sophisticated population genetic studies, in fact, population genomic studies now. And again, that's something we'll cover more uh, in the third year. But really what we're going to look at in this lecture is one particular question about our closest relatives. But just, just to give you a Again, some of the questions that we can ask in evolutionary, looking at evolutionary history versus evolutionary biology. So, you know, how, are, how is our species related to others? When did we split? When and where did our species originate? Uh, how did humans people the world? And again, that's a question for next year. Uh, was there any gene flow between us and other lineages, eight archaic lineages? And th th those are kind of history, history questions, you know. How did these things happen? When did they happen? There's also biological questions about, you know, what was it that actually made us distinctively human, separate from other primates, other animals in general? What were the evolutionary processes at work? And what adaptive changes are actually going on? What evolution is still going on in humans? But as I say, we're going to focus today on the actual origins uh, of humans and particularly where is our closest relative, what is our closest relative. And if you go back to, to Darwin's time as the originator of evolutionary biology, 
He didn't actually say much about human evolution in the origin of species at all. He just had this one throwaway line that light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. But uh, 12 years later, when he actually wrote the first uh, edition of The Descent of Man, he actually then uh, looked into this in far more detail and was far more forthcoming in his opinions on what uh, the origins of humans were. And he speculated that humans actually originated in Africa. He said that in each age group, each great region of the world, the living mammals are closely related to the extinct species of the same region. It is therefore probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes closely allied to the gorilla and chimpanzee, and as these two species are now man's uh, nearest allies, it's somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. Darwin's contemporary uh, and fierce supporter, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, also wrote about uh, uh, human evolution and, and relationships to other uh, animals, particularly in evidence as to man's place in nature, which he wrote in 1863. Um, and he concluded it's quite certain that the ape which most closely uh, approaches man in the totality of his organisation is either the chimpanzee or the gorilla. So that, that was where things sat uh, towards the middle, towards the end of the 19th century. Let's just though take a side step and look at some of the conceptual background to our thinking in this matter. So if you go back to when I was a boy in the 1960s, the view that, that was taken of evolution was epitomised by this very famous uh, picture here, uh, by a guy called Zallinger, which entitled The March of Progress. And it basically shows this linear progression uh, from various fossil primates slowly progressing towards modern man. So on the left there, starting off with Pliopithecus and Proconsul and so forth, all the way through these in this linear fashion. Now, in fact, that way of thinking. Uh, and, and it, well, I should say, and this particular uh, iconography has become very widespread. Um, here's one that you often see on T-shirts. Here's one I prepared actually during the uh, last uh, American election, uh, just showing basically that Obama was the epitome, of, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of human perfection uh, and evolution compared to his kind of Republican uh, contender. But as I say, when I uh, was a young man, it, we, we, the, the thing we were taught was, yeah, this was the way to think about it, that there, uh, there was this idea that there was this Ramapithecus, uh, the earliest known hominid, and it was thought that this lineage, our human lineage, had diverged from the African apes a long time ago, 15 to 28 million years ago. And again, this fits nicely with the conceit of human arrogance that we are so special that we must have separated from the animal world a long time ago and had our own lineage that led to us uh, quite separate from all those kind of subhuman animals out there. But of course, it's actually a misreading of Darwin to think this way in, in, in a sense. Because if you look at what Darwin said, and this is one of his very earliest sketches on this notion of the tree of life, wrote in one of his notebooks uh, in the 1830s, he actually draws a, a branching tree, a very bushy tree, in fact. Um, and in, uh, implicit in Darwin's uh, ideas of evolution is not that you're actually climbing some ladder, moving towards perfection, but just basically life diverges. You get descent with modification, you get branching, and if you get enough branching going on, you end up with a, a very bushy kind of relationship between organisms rather than any idea of climbing a ladder. So again, it's just people keep forgetting this uh, and we keep having to remember this. Actually, we're not climbing some ladder of nature up to perfection. In fact, humans are just one branch of this tree um, and... It's kind of fractal. The closer you go in, it, things still seem bushy as you get closer and closer, uh, as we will see. So in fact now, 
This is from my book, The Rough Guide to Evolution, which I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and this is borrowed from a guy, Fred Spohr, down at UCL. Basically, we have a very uh, bushy kind of evolution here. Lots of different kinds of, of, of a human relative, uh, uncertain relationships between them. Um, and at any one time, there may be several different uh, representatives um, of, uh, uh, of human-like apes on the planet. So, that was just an aside. Let's get back then to this question of who is our closest relative? And, as we said, from the time of Huxley, pretty much there's a consensus that we belong with the great apes. In fact, even Linnaeus, who invented modern classification, put humans in with the primates. Um, and so we've got these, we've got the gibbon, orang, gorilla, and chimp as the possible candidates, with uh, most bets going to be on the gorilla or the chimpanzee as our closest relative. Now, again, let's just look at this conceptually. It's kind of obvious, isn't it, that the chimp and the gorilla are more closely related to each other than either of them is to us. You can just look at these two kind of brutish mothers there, hairy brutes, uh, sucking their young, and then compare that with the affection of the Madonna and child. It's obvious uh, that these two are closely related to each other, and we're a branch out here. Um, they have these clear shared traits. They, they uh, have knuckle walking. <coughs> their teeth, teeth are different. They have this thin um, enamel. Humans have a lot of derived traits which are not shared by these others. Uh, we have bipedalism, this S-shaped spine, bowl-like pelvis, giant brains, chins, small snouts, they're hairless. And of course the thing that makes us not animals, in one sense, is that we have tools, we have culture, we have language. So the, the question really, uh, when you first look at this issue, in terms of intu intuition is, well, Okay, did we branch off before the orangutans, or did we branch off afterwards? One caveat, though, is that we don't have any fossils of gorillas or chimps. Aside from there's one chimpanzee tooth, but that's about it in terms of the fossil record of gorillas and chimpanzees. So perhaps we couldn't, shouldn't be quite so, shouldn't jump to conclusions on this one. Uh, and perhaps be a bit more careful in our thinking. So what kind of evidence can we look for from molecules to try and resolve this question? Well, in fact, this uh, subject goes back a long way, back even to 1904, where uh, this guy Nuttall showed that human, if you raise uh, anti-serum against human um, uh, serum, you get much stronger reaction with that anti-human anti-serum with gorilla and, and chimp serum than you do with orang or gibbon, suggesting that, yes, along with morphology, this is being supported. Um, Goodman in the early 1960s showed that it actually was quite hard to distinguish between the human and great ape albumins, um, and he suggested there was this kind of hominoid slowdown. So if you looked at different kind relatives of the cow, you could see quite big differences between species that didn't look that different. Whereas when you look at humans, chimps, gorillas, and so forth, you don't um, see such big differences. But again, he confirmed that human, chimp, gorilla belong together uh, to the exclusion of orangs, but couldn't actually work out whether there was, um, you know, the, the, dif the distance between humans and the African apes was the same as the distance between chimps and gorillas. You really couldn't work out what the branching pattern was. And similar uh, results were obtained using a different approach, serum protein electrophoresis. Now again, I keep having to take little side steps just to provide you with some of the conceptual background to the way we think. Uh, have you had any teaching on cladistics in your course up till now, or ever heard of it? No. So, so Another thing that happened in the middle of the 20th century was this so-called cladistics revolution. This guy, Willy Hennig, uh, a German uh, entomologist, came up with an, uh, a framework for classifying organisms, which he called phylogenetic systematics. 
Uh, it's now more, more commonly called cladistics. Um, and he, he, although he started off very small, just looking at a small number of organisms, he, his uh, method and his approach kind of was rolled out and has been rolled out across most of, of biology. So what he says is that you have to, ha when you're defining a taxon, it has to be what we call monophyletic. Um, so what that means is that it has to include all the descendants of one particular common ancestor and only the descendants of that common ancestor. So you can't mix and match groups that don't have a, that, you know, that, that, that's, that, um, <laughs> you can't include two groups uh, which have a common ancestor and then exclude a load of other groups that have the same common ancestor. So for example, and, and there's this various jargon that's used by these taxonomists. So um, if we take amniotes, for example, as a general group, these are considered the monophyletic group. There was an ancestor of all amniotes here, down here on the tree, and all of the descendants fall within that, that uh, taxon of amniotes. But if we look at things like reptiles, taxonomists don't allow us to use the word reptile anymore because reptiles are what they call a paraphyletic group. They include some of the descendants of uh, that recent common ancestor, but they exclude birds, and they exclude mammals, in fact. Um, and so that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Uh, why would you, that's just not allowed under this system. Similarly, you can have mammals and birds. You could say, well, they're both warm-blooded, but in fact, there is no way of defining them as a, as a monophyletic taxon as well. They're sort of what's called a polyphyletic group. So what, when, when this is applied to human evolution, we've seen progressively over the last uh, few decades successive changes in the way we draw the tree and also in the way in which we give these taxonomic names uh, to the various branch points, the various clades on this tree. Um, so initially, it was thought that there was a superfamily of hominoids and then humans were hominids and, and the hominid, hominidae branch was exclusively for our, us, and homo belonged in there. And then pongidae was where you chucked all the other uh, great apes, uh, and then the uh, gibbons were off as a branch there. Well, now we recognize that, we, we, first of all, we don't, one of the things that, that goes with cladistics is you don't like trichotomies, you don't like three things coming out. It should be a successive state, a series of stages of branching binary, a bifurcation of the lineage. And so uh, about 20 years ago or 30 years ago, this was the view was that we had hominoids. But we then said, OK, we've got hominids. But within the hominids, we allow there to be um, these. Uh, we put the uh, uh, orangutan out as the early branch point. So that belongs in its own uh, family there, the Ponginae. But we have to allow the chimpanzee and the gorilla to come in with us in the hominidae. Now, something quite uh, unexpected also happened in the 1960s, towards the end of the 1960s, where there was a counterblast to the view that we had this long, long lineage that was our own. And it came from these, these two guys here, Sarich and Wilson. And again, they looked at using immunological approaches, but they did things a bit more sophisticated than people have done in the past. Um, and using their immunological uh, uh, assays, they looked at the degree of similarity uh, in, in terms of the immunological similarity and used that to infer when it was that humans and apes, great apes, shared a most recent common ancestor. And they said, well, if we take the view that the distance between humans and old world monkeys in immunological space, if you like, equates to 30 million years of evolution, the distance between humans and great apes uh, is about a sixth of that. So it means that they probably diverged about 5 million years ago. Now, at the time, this was completely uh, outrageous. Paleontologists and and any expert on human evolution, they were all just spluttering away, saying these molecular people, they just don't know what they're talking about. That's simply not possible. We know that humans have this long ancestry, and they're talking rubbish. 
turned out uh, they were pretty much spot on. Uh, and uh, they were remarkably prescient in, in their estimations. Another conceptual thing we have to mention as we're going along also, conceptual advance, was this paper again in the 1960s from Zucker, Candle and Pauling. And what they said was that um, you could actually take molecules and you could take the sequences within the molecules, within these macromolecules, the proteins and DNA, and you could actually use that as doc use them as documents of evolutionary history. So you could actually look at the uh, substitutions, uh, differences between sequences, count them up, and, and actually start reconstructing evolution uh, just from sequences alone. Um, and in fact, this was the beginning of a, re of a revolution, so that alongside morphology, which was what people had had up till then, morphology of living organisms or morphological com uh, comparisons with fossils, we now had an entirely independent uh, way of documenting uh, uh, evolutionary relationships, branching, and so forth, using molecular biology. So how does... Uh, oh, and yes, another... There's a lot going on in the 60s. Another important uh, step forward was, came from this guy here, Kimura, uh, Moto Kimura, um, who posited that neutral mutations predominate in evolution. So when you're looking at the molecular level, there's all sorts of changes going on, but they have no impact, impact at all on the biology of the organism, no impact on the phenotype. So if you think about it in its simplest way, uh, we have this redundant genetic code where we have 64 codons coding for 20 amino acids. Uh, amino acid like glycine, there are four different codons that will code for that. Any change in that third codon, uh, third uh, position in the codon, actually won't make any difference to the amino acid that's produced. Um, so there's all those kind of changes that are allowed by evolution. They're not going to have any effect on, on, on natural selection, adaptation, anything like that. But interestingly, they accumulate in a kind of clock-like way. The, the assumption underlying all this is that those, those mutations are occurring in, 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 in roughly the same uh, kind of frequency over time. And this allows you then to draw out some kind of uh, uh, phylogenetic tree. So you start off with some sequence data. This is a rather old-fashioned slide. In fact, we don't look at sequences in chromatograms like that anymore. Um, but you then can call out those sequences and, and align them. So alignment is one of the important things. So you have stretches that you can produce a trusted alignment on. And then you look for differences. Um, and those differences should be informative as to which things go together in one branch and which go together in another, another branch. As you can see here, these polymorphic sites, sometimes they disagree. They're not giving the same story. So here, that first one, you've got human, chimp, gorilla all coming together, and then the orang being different. Over here, though, uh, you've got a mutation in the chimp lineage and leaving the others together. But if you collect enough of this information, then you should be able to. You ho would hope that you would end up getting a robust conclusion about the branching uh, patterns uh, leading to the, these different uh, lineages. And so you, you end up... You can end up with something looking like that, if you like. This is an exemplary. It's not a, a real um, set of sequences. So during the 1970s and 1980s, there were lots of studies that went on uh, looking to um, see if you could draw these trees for humans, chimps, gorillas, uh, and other apes. Um, and they established that, yes, indeed, humans, chimps, and gorillas belong together in a clade, but the sequences are all very similar. In fact, we now know, I think it's a, th a third of your protein sequences are, are identical to those in every amino acid, to those in the chimpanzee. So you know, it was hard to find, actually, informative changes in those sequences. Only at uh, one stage there was only one amino acid change supporting the human chimpanzee clade, and so we were left with this tri what's, what was often called the trichotomy, this kind of messy picture where we had the gorilla, chimp, and human 
separating from a common ancestor, but being unable to work out which one came up first. Now, you might have noticed a subtle change in thinking from what I said earlier. I said in, intuitively, you know, we, we just ask the man on the street. It's obvious, isn't it, that the chimps and gorillas go together. But in fact, by this stage, we began to realize, no, we can't make that assumption. In fact, we just don't know. And we have to uh, collect more information to work out what, which branch came off where. Another approach that was used was DNA-DNA hybridization. So this was in the days before we could sequence whole genomes. You could still isolate the whole genome. You could isolate the DNA from, uh, from the nucleus, the nuclear DNA from, from uh, human cells and chimp cells. And what you do is you mix, uh, the, the, you denature, say, the human DNA, you denature chimp DNA, and you allow it to re anneal and, and you find that it re anneals with a certain dynamic. You then mix human DNA with chimp DNA uh, and uh, you then measure the melting temperature for that duplex. So you allow them to anneal and then you try and melt again and you see if there's uh, any diff if, if they melt, more, th th those strands melt more quickly using that approach. So, uh, they, the, so there were a couple of studies here which suggested yes, that it was chimps and humans that went together um, and th that they were it was more uh, a more stable uh, duplex than the gorilla chimp or the human gorilla. Things marched on with sequence data into the 1990s. Uh, single gene phylogenies still were giving contradictory results, but by the towards the end of the 1990s, it really became clear that if you just took lots and lots of gene sequences and concatenated them, and then draw drew a family tree phylogenetic tree from that then you end up getting solid support for the human chimp clade. Um, and it really became uh, pretty much certainty in the late 90s that actually humans and chimps were most closely related. There are, why should there be problems? Why shouldn't all of the sequences give the same answer? Well, there is this problem of, of, of incomplete lineage sorting. Um, and what happens is you can get multiple uh, genes, polymorphisms in, 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 in genes, and multiple genes, and some of those lineages will die out, those gene lineages will die out in one lineage but not in another, and then you'll end up making comparisons that make two things, so if you see here species three, uh, that one of those lineages has died out, but it's retained itself in species one and two. If you compared all three examples of gene B, you'd end up drawing a tree which was not representative of the phylogeny of the species as a whole. A bit like, you know, if we take, say, ABO blood groups. ABO blood groups can be found in chimpanzees. And if you took um, my, I don't know what my blood group is, let's say I was an A blood group, uh, and you were an O blood group, and then we took a chimpanzee who was an A blood group, we might draw an erroneous conclusion as to the relationships between us, just from one gene alone. And in fact, this is a continual problem. I was speaking to someone in Oxford a, a couple of weeks ago. The gorilla genome hasn't yet been published, but he told me that there was, a, uh, I think, a third of the genes in the gorilla genome were giving this kind of picture. Was it a third, or is it a certain, certainly a very high number of genes in that genome? Other evidence. Well, if you look at mobile elements, so these ALU elements that jump around in the genome, you can actually draw phylogenetic influences, evolutionary influences from where they sit in the genome. So if you assume that a thing jumps once and it ends up, they're jumping randomly, so the chances of them ending up in any particular place in the genome are very small. If you find them in the same place in the genome in the human and the chimp, then that suggests that there was an ancestral jumping event in the ancestor in the lineage leading up to, to the human and chimp. Um, um, and in fact, that is what was found. So this study here, they actually looked at these ALU elements and they drew a phylogenetic tree based on, on the jumping patterns. And they again showed quite robustly that humans uh, and chimps uh, belong together. You might say, well, why do you have to do all this molecular biology? 
Can't you just do morphology? Surely the answer should be there in the bones and the tendons and the muscles and all those other things. Well, in fact, that's true. If it, there were some studies done uh, in, in, in the early part of this century uh, looking at uh, the DNA evidence, but also looking at fossil evidence and looking at soft tissue anatomy. Um, and these did come to the conclusion that, in fact, yes, there were some things that we shared with chimpanzees to the exclusion of the other great apes. Um, and here's another one, morphometrics and homoloid phylogeny. Having said that, though, there was one dissenting view, uh, a complete, what would now be a completely mad view, which was actually that we are second orangutans, that, in fact, we show more similarity morphologically uh, to orangutans. Um, so I know that Susanna Thorpe has told you a little bit about the similarities between uh, orang uh, locomotion and human locomotion, but that's not quite the same as saying they're our closest relative. Um, and this paper actually tried to suggest that, but it's been completely shredded by uh, reviewers and bloggers and other people in the field. It's totally disregarded now. So. The general consensus is that morphology does actually support this as well. So we end up with this. Completely counterintuitive, but you are more closely related to a chimp than a chimp is related to a gorilla. Uh, uh, we are actually, these are our closest relatives. In fact, this is a bit of, this is a cladogram where we don't actually put lengths on things here. We just show the order of the branching. But in fact, in reality, the distance between this branch point and this branch point was a very short period of time, a few hundreds of thousands of years at most. Um, so it, it, you know, it, that's why it was so hard to, to do. Now, you could argue we didn't need to do that. Just, just have a look around. You can see people that look pretty much like chimpanzees, uh, and, and you know, so the similarities are obvious. This slide worked better a few years ago before Obama got elected, but there we go. So, what about the taxonomy? How does that affect taxonomy? Well, we had another taxonomic adjustment there because we, once we'd sorted this thing out, we then had to say, well, actually, the gorillas come off uh, in their own branch, and we're left with a separate group down here, the hominini, with uh, um, chimpanzees. So now we have the gibbons branching off, then the orangs, then the gorillas, and the humans and chimps left together. And in fact, the paleontologists are having to, the paleoanthropologists are having to change their names. They used to talk about ancient hominids. They now talk about ancient hominins because they have a sub-tribe of hominina, which is not shown on that uh, uh, tree here, which is, is used to describe uh, anything on the human lineage after we diverged from the chimp lineage. Um, and so you'll find this sort of change in nomenclature that people will be talking about fossil hominins when 20, 30 years ago they'd been talking about fossil hominids. When did it happen? Well, if we look at the, a variety of um, lines of evidence, they do all converge on something not far uh, from what Sarich and Wilson said back in the 60s. Uh, somewhere about five to seven million years ago, probably around six million is the kind of average consensus view. Looking at evidence from immunology, DNA, DNA hybridization, mitochondrial divergences, nuclear divergences, and so forth. Now, actually, can that create some problems because um, some of the fossils which have been described as on our lineage, on the, on the lineage leading to us, actually pretty much date to that time. Um, so, so Salanthropus chidensis, you know, it's really actually about the time that, that the human uh, chimp divergence occurred. And so there's been a lot of soul searching about what all that means. Does it mean that actually we've got the date wrong or is it actually we you shouldn't call that a, ho uh, uh, um, a hominin or, uh, or what was going on? And it's still a little bit of a contentious issue there. What kind of speciation happened? Well, this interesting paper came out in 2006 that said, well, actually, um, 
maybe it wasn't quite so simple. So it, they, their analysis, they said that the human chimpanzee speciation occurred less than 6.3 million years ago, um, conflicting, as they say, with interpretations of ancient fossils. But the chromosome X showed a much younger uh, genetic time. So if you look at the physical position across the, 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 the genome of how much difference there is between uh, at each physical position, how much difference there is between us and chimpanzees, you get a generally uh, reasonable kind of average that, fit, you know, not much deviation from the average, apart from the X chromosome where there's a significantly lower divergence. Um, and this paper, Patterson et al. in 2006, suggested that that actually told us something about um, human chimp speciation. That there was an initial speciation event 6.3 million years ago, uh, or, or greater than 6.3 million years ago, and then there was some kind of hybridization. So that the lineages started to diverge, um, and then uh, they, they, they joined again. Um, this interpretation is not without criticism. And there have been some other people who said, oh, well, there are simpler explanations. You don't have to make such a complex picture. But it's, it's interesting because it points out that you know, our simple ways of thinking about the world do, do need to be challenged. We, don't, we have to be careful of not just falling into the trap of thinking simplistically. Last few minutes of, of today's talk, which uh, I've deliberately uh, left as, as not fully, filling the full hour, I'm just going to talk a few more about a few more of these conceptual issues. So um, it's been argued that uh, well, Goodman, when, when he first noticed that, that uh, humans and chimps share about 98.3% of their non-coding DNA, 99.5% of protein coding sequences, he has suggested an even more radical taxonomic change. He said, "Well, actually, we should all be in the same genus." So given that. Homo was named first, chimps and gorillas, uh, sorry, chimps and bonobos should join us in the genus Homo. Um, so in a sense they are kind of humans. Jared Diamond in his book The Third Chimpanzee has made the other point, which is actually we're the third chimpanzee. If you were classifying organisms out there, animals uh, generally, um, you know, you look at species of bovid or of equines or canines or whatever, you, you would just uh, lump us all together and say we're all one uh, uh, genus um, uh, and we're just a, an outlying chimpanzee. It's also been said, there's been a lot of field observations of chimps and bonobos that kind of undermine the claims of human uniqueness in tool use, tool creation, sexuality, all those kind of things. Some of those um, have not, are not uh, to be taken without some degree of criticism or skepticism. Uh, in fact, a few weeks ago, we interviewed a guy here who's coming for a job who takes a very hard line view. It says that there is no great ape culture apart from human culture. Uh, that all those observations and claims about culture in gorillas and chimps and so forth uh, are all fallacious and wishful thinking on the part of the observer um, and those interpreting the results. But some have gone far enough to say, well, actually, we should be, as these are effectively uh, humans, honorary humans, if you like, they should be given human rights. And the, the Great Ape Project actually says that we should be treating these great apes the same way as we treat other humans and giving them uh, these inalienable rights, the rights to life and freedom and, and so forth. Um, this is uh, from the BBC, um, they're just making this point that actually there are these uh, arguments out there and in fact in, in the Austrian courtroom they were tried out a few years ago uh, there was a particular chimpanzee shown here uh, who called, called uh, Yesel, uh, who's abducted from his family tribe in West Africa. Um, and there was this question about whether actually it should be given human status, personhood, and be allowed, a, a woman would be allowed to become its legal guardian. Um, in fact, it, it was in the court they decided, as far as they were concerned, it was just an animal and it wasn't going to get these rights. But it's interesting that these things are actually popping up in the courtrooms. 
Of course, this idea that we're 98% chimp or 99% chimp also has kind of philosophical ramifications. It's a simplistic way of thinking about the world. So this is what Steve Jones pointed out. As most people know, chimpanzees, chimpanzees share about 98% of our DNA, but bananas, I just ate a banana before, this actually shares 50% of my DNA, uh, and I'm not 50% banana. Um, and we're uniquely human. Uh, chimpanzees are uniquely chimpanzee. Um, and and it's, it's mad, like he says, to apply things like rights and apply it to an animal which is not human. Uh, and also the, there is this flip side of rights, which is responsibilities. You never see a chimp being fined for stealing a plate of bananas. Uh, it's an interesting a book by Jeremy Taylor written a couple of years ago, uh, taking these arguments, looking at the differences between humans and chimpanzees, uh, teasing out the consequences of these arguments. Called not, it was, that book's called Not a Chimp. I'd, I'd recommend you read it. Another uh, interesting question is how much evolutionary time separates us from chimps. I tried this out on my 16-year-old da daughter this morning, and she fell into the trap straight away. How long, how many years separate us from a chimp? Anyone want to anticipate the answer? 12 million, exactly so. Six million years to the common ancestor with a chimpanzee, but the, the separation between these two um, individuals here, these two versions of Helena Bonham Carter, is actually 12 million years ago. So we, we again, people continually fall into the trap of thinking that, well, the chimp was like the ancestor, and we've gone so far along our own path, uh, and uh, they've stood still. I don't know, have you had anything about Artificus so far? Artificus around us with Susanna? I mean, this thinking that, the, that the, we must have had a knuckle-walking ancestor that looked like the chimp and the gorilla is actually, not only is it philosophically kind of flawed, but now there's evidence emerging that the, the closest full sort of fossil record that we have, samples that, that, that show the postcranial uh, part of the body from Ardipithecus rhamnus, these show um, that this uh, ancestor on the human line uh, was actually much more human-like than you'd expect for uh, something that was 4.4 million years old, so two-thirds of the way towards our common ancestor. Um, and in, there was a uh, there's a whole section in Science Magazine devoted to Ardipithecus, which would be worth reading if you're interested to follow it up. And this is what they say. They say, Ardipithecus rhamnus lacks any characters suggestive of suspension, vertical climbing, or knuckle walking. Ardipithecus rhamnus uh, indicates that despite the genetic similarities of living humans and chimpanzees, the ancestor we last shared probably differed substantially from any extant African <coughs> ape. Humans and extant African apes have become highly specialized through very different evolutionary pathways. So there's six million years of evolution from that common ancestor to give you chimpanzees, just as there's six million years of evolution to give you us as well. And that's me finished for today. We'll look at this a bit more uh, when we look at actual genome comparisons on Monday. I'm happy now to take any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to get some lunch.